The last time we had the lecture, uh, we were talking about biomes and well, the factors that are going to influence uh, what kinds of plants and animals are going to be able to live in a particular biome. Well, that's going to be starting off with the abiotic factors. And so we're right at the beginning, sunlight giving us the warmth, temperature, and water. Those are the two fundamental abiotic factors that are going to influence the distribution of organisms around the world. And so, you know, we're going to touch on the tundra here in a little bit, but before we did that, I wanted to show, you know, this is similar to one of the figures I showed you before, but now we're looking in a book and it, and it has a nicer, well, appeal to it, I think. We look over here and we see annual precipitation. We look down here, we see average temperature. And so way down here in this corner, low precipitation, low temperature, there's the tundra. That's what we want to talk about initially in this lecture, the tundra. So very cold, very dry. Now we head out this way. Oh, now it's a whole lot warmer, right? There's 30 degrees centigrade. And that would be a little uncomfortable for us. You know, uh, our body temperature is 97.8 uh, or something like that, or 37 degrees centigrade. So 30 degrees centigrade. Well, it's getting, you know, up into the, the high 80s, uh, 90s when you're in around this area of the, of the temperatures. So a little bit on the hot side. But if we have low, right, low precipitation, well, we're going to be having a desert condition. If we have really high precipitation, tropical rainforest. So high temperatures, high precipitation. And we look and we see, you know, oh, my goodness. There's 400 right in the middle of, of tropical rainforest, 400 centimeters. Uh, and so we got to kind of figure out, you know, what that 400 centimeters really means. Uh, you know, I happen to have a, a, a ruler here. And so we take a look at that ruler and here's, here's where 12 inches is. And I go down here and I see, yeah, just a, a little more than than 30 centimeters. So inches above, centimeters below. Um, you know, we can take one foot to be somewhere equivalent to around 30, 30 and a half uh, centimeters. And so, you know, if we multiply by 10, well, 10 feet is going to be 300 centimeters, right? And so 300 centimeters gets us this high up, temperate rainforest. And so a little bit cooler temperatures, a little bit less rain, but we look at Seattle and we see temperate rainforest all along that west coast up north along Washington, up into Canada there. Uh, well, you know, tropical rainforest uh, right in the middle here, that was 400. And so, you know, if we had 90 more, uh, that would get us 390 centimeters, uh, and that would be about three more feet. So 13 feet, 13 feet of rain in a year gets us into this vicinity here. Not the maximum amount, but you know, kind of, well, it's what we make the tropical green for. That's a lot of rain. And so you can imagine you got that much rain, it's nice and warm. Uh, lots of niches. You got these huge trees growing, all kinds of plants, yet lots of animals. Very high diversity. Contrast that with what we're going to talk about with the tundra. Pretty low diversity. So the closer you get to the equator, the more likely you're going to have high diversity. The further away, well, up here in Antarctica and up here in the Arctic, right? Antarctica down here, Arctic up there. Very low diversity. Okay, when we look at our examples of biomes, we're gonna focus on the tundra as our big example. And so you see northernmost biome, uh, circumpolar. And so looking down on top of the North Pole, here's the whole Northern hemisphere. And we look and we see, yep, there's Greenland 
There's the top of Canada, Alaska here, all through here, what used to be the Soviet Union, Russia and, and whatnot. And then uh, down there, there's Sweden and Norway, England there. Okay, and so they're showing us a few dotted lines here and the dotted lines are, are basically indicating where we have the, the Arctic tundra, you know, within the dotted lines. So Northern and Southern limits of the Arctic tundra. So it goes all the way around the, the North Pole circumpolar. Uh, here's a different map that kind of shows the distribution. Yep, tundra all through here around the bottom of Greenland and then uh, all through Northern uh, Europe and Asia right there. So circumpolar. Notice that we don't have, you know, any tundra in the Southern because basically you're in the ocean where you would expect, you know, the tundra to be. If we moved um, Australia here down around here, yeah, you'd get some tundra there. And then you go a little bit further down and you're in Antarctica. And so most of the year, you know, pretty much nine months of the year, nine and a half months of the year, it's going to be a frozen uh, tundra area where, you know, maybe a muskox or so might be able to be found uh, underneath the snow. You might have some, some voles uh, running around, a few little mice that basically build little tunnels and, and feed on the, the growth that they can, um, you know, it's not plants that are growing, but, you know, stuff that has basically uh, died for the winter and, and they're still feeding on it, looking for a seed here, a seed there. And, and surviving as best they can. There might be a little fox running around and listening for the little mouse scampering under the snow and then just jumping through the snow to try and get the, the little mouse or whatever. Uh, kind of like cats go for moles in, in the backyard of your lawn. All right. And so defining features. We start off when we look at a biome. What's going on? in the abiotic conditions because what's going on abiotically is going to then lead to what can survive, what plants are going to be there. And so we take a look. This is high Arctic. It's dry. Remember, it's cool, uh, uh, very dry air that's descending on those convection currents, that polar convection current coming down. And so you know, you got dry as summer and fall cold rains, all right? Um, and that's going to be basically the only time you're getting any kind of precipitation at all. Um, and that's kind of a good time, you know, summer, because that's when plants are going to be interested in, in the water. All right, freezing temperatures any day of the year. So it's middle of August and you can get a freeze. These plants that are up there are not going to be, you know, your, your everyday uh, coleus. They're going to be hardy plants that can survive, you know, perennials and annuals that, uh, you know, will get, get through a rough summer, uh, get their seeds out, or be able to go dormant and then come back the next year. All right, even in the warm month, you know, 15 degrees centigrade, it's still pretty cold, right? Uh, you're going to have these really prolific growth seasons. So 60, 70 days a year, you're in that northern, uh, uh, almost, you know, up into the Arctic there. You're in this northern uh, 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 landscape. And so during the summer, you have just an incredibly long daytime during the summer. The, the earth is tilted toward the sun. And so during the day, you can have, you know, a 24 hour, uh, uh, you know, day going on up there. And so for the summer, you can have, you know, maybe not really intense heat, but a very intense growth season. And those plants, if they aren't really going at it all at once, growing, getting as much done as they can, getting as much uh, uh, photosynthesis, storing, they're not going to make it till the next year. And so 
everything is going to be growing at the same time, blooming at the same time. You got this proliferation of insects. Right? Well, that will come down here uh, after we get through vegetation. But proliferation of insects, you're going to have so many mosquitoes, so many insects running around. Very productive for those few months, you know, a month and a half, two months, extraordinarily productive. And that's going to be important when we talk about animals migrating in. Now, the soils, they are really kind of an interesting thing. Um, you have all that snow that had fallen uh, and it had frozen. Well, when it melts, it's going to just saturate the ground. So saturated ground. And then what we find is that, well, you know, it will melt and it will freeze and it will melt and it will freeze. And what we end up seeing is a lot of the tundra is going to have this kind of, you know, during the summer, water pooling in these little rectangular, octagonal, polygonal shapes, right? Because it's kind of like the mud cracks. When you look at the drying mud puddles in your backyard, in your driveway, you'll see that yeah, we form these polygonal shaped mud cracks as the mud dries out and contracts and we leave these gaps. Then the rain fills and the dry mud kind of fills back. But you still get this uh, situation up in the tundra of, of ice expanding and uh, then when it thaws, the, the water, you know, doesn't take up quite as much room as the ice, and we just build up these little ridges through here. And so polygonal shapes and a lot of standing water in the tundra, right? And so here, another overview, a little bit different configuration, the polygons may not be quite as well developed, but, you know, short shrubby vegetation, uh, you know, all kinds of, of standing water, and what's kind of important in all of this is that water has gone through, it's saturated, and it's down in the subsoil, below the level of, of the free uh, soil on top. In the subsoil layer, it's still frozen, right? The temperature never gets high enough that we actually melt the ice that's about you know, a foot and a half down or so. And so we have permafrost. A reason why the water never percolates through the soil, because the permafrost prevents it from soaking in and going deep. It just stays right on the top. All right, so the soils, well, they tend to be nutrient poor. Um, we saw the, poly the polygons there, uh, pushes the soil around shallow lakes, you saw the picture, and glaciation. Imagine, you know, maybe not that many thousands of years ago, all that snow accumulating, rolling down the hills, whatever kind of steepness you might have in the landscape, glaciers would kind of flow there. And so we look and we see a denuded landscape, yeah, uh, you know, the, the soil's been scraped along the top to the bedrock in the soil. It takes time to redevelop. And so, yeah, poor soil after the glacier has kind of bulldozed the lot of it away. Uh, we look and we see kind of rounded hills. You don't have that sharp uh, um, uh, alpine peak where the snow has actually kind of torn away at the sides and left these these steep crags. No, the, the glaciers have kind of flowed over and rounded, and the, the valleys here are rounded. And so, you know, again, are, are very different than the cutting V shape that you'd find when you have a lot of free flowing water etching through your landscape. Here it's glaciers kind of bulldozing through, and that's what they left behind. You may not be seeing glaciers right now, rolling over the tundra, but not too many thousands of years ago, that's what was going on. Okay, so we look a little bit further down here and we see the kind of vegetation, you know, short but really prolific uh, uh, 
gross season, maybe 700 species, but that would be impoverished compared to the tropical rainforest. In the tropical rainforest, you know, you'd probably be able to, uh, you know, chop down one tree and then start looking at all the vegetation that is growing on that tree and come up with 700 different species on a tree, right? Not even talking about, you know, on the ground, but, uh, you know, just incredible amount of, of diversity down in the tropical rainforest. Uh, trees. You don't have trees up there because think, you've got all this soft soil the trees aren't going to be able to anchor themselves down into that deep subsoil where you have it frozen, right? Frozen water, you're not going to have plants growing there, right? You don't see any in Antarctica. Plants really just don't do well if they cannot get the water to move up through their little capillaries. And so the trees can't get their roots deep enough and so now you got a soggy, soppy soil during the couple months of, of summer. And then what happens, the winds blow, a hard wind knocks down any kind of tree that tries to grow there. And so it just doesn't work out for the tree. It's a bad deal. All right, we got the plants in place. The plants are dependent on the abiotic, you know, what the temperature, what the precipitation is, the animals. Well, they're going to be worried about, you know, being limited by temperature and, you know, water constraints, but they need the plants. So the animals fill on the plants. And we see, yep, lots of migratory birds. Birds aren't going to be real happy there during the middle of winter. Yeah, maybe you might find a, a snowy owl or something, but you're not going to find a whole lot of uh, uh, other birds, you know, ducks, geese, whatever. You know, geese are going to be real prolific up there uh, because they have been down in the southern uh, uh, parts of the world feeding, you know, all winter long. Now it's summer and they go way up there and they find a great place where you can have thousands and thousands of birds just building nests everywhere. And there aren't enough wolves, there aren't enough foxes, there aren't enough polar bears. They eat the millions of geese, right? And the foxes, the, the polar bears, the wolves, they have to survive there over the winter. And so there's not gonna be a whole lot of food over the winter. So that's kind of limiting how many of them there can be. Even though there's plenty of birds to eat during the summer, they don't have enough to keep a population high during the winter. So, you know, if you're going to be a bird, you can nest, you know, in the southern uh, uh, parts of the world, but you got all those predators there and plenty of them year round. Up here in the north, there's going to be far fewer predators per uh, uh, population of, of migrating birds. So it's a great thing for, for the birds. Um, and there's an awful lot of insects, you know, for them to eat, uh, uh, lots of vegetation, uh, if you're a herbivore type of, of bird. Large mammals, well, you know, we can look and we can see caribou, bear, well, they're kind of omnivores, really. they're gonna eat most anything, but the caribou, these are uh, Santa's reindeer, right? Uh, but, you know, caribou in the, the new world, we have uh, wild, caribou. In the old world, well, they were domesticated. And so, yeah, uh, reindeer, caribou. Uh, muskox, polar bear, doll sheep, uh, bear, you know, all these are the real large mammals running around. Uh, they're staying there pretty much all year round. And so they got to be able to survive during the winter. You saw the picture of the muskox. They're going to be kind of tough. And with that big head that they have, kind of like the buffalo, you get a little bit of snow, you can push the snow with your head back and forth and you can get at the food that is under all that snow cover. Uh, polar bears, you know, you think about them, they can actually go into a little bit of a hibernative mode. Um, and so they can outlast the winter, they can hunt during the winter and try and find any little bit 
that might be out there still, uh, you know, waiting to be eaten. Uh, the foxes, whatever, they're going after the small mammals, the small mammals. Once you're under that snow cover, it's, it can be warm under there, right? I mean, not, you know, 90 degrees sauna, but, you know, a whole lot warmer than the uh, uh, negative 40 degrees above the snow pack. That snow insulates. And so if you're, you know, a bunch of little warm lemmings and you're in your little burrow underground, uh, it's not so bad, apparently. And of course, you know, slow the metabolism, go into a little bit of torpor and come out, form little tunnels under the snow, find the seeds and, and whatnot. Um, during that summer months, oh my goodness, the uh, dormant uh, insect eggs that have overwintered, now they're back with a vengeance during those few months because they'll feed on anything uh, that might migrate up there. And, you know, of course, you know, if you're a, a black fly, maybe it gets snapped up by some of those migrating birds too. Uh, but again, we come back to the whole business of we only have two months of productivity. Tropical rainforest, in contrast, you know, 12 months of growth and, and uh, just increasing biomass. Uh, huge diversity, tropical rainforest very low when we look at the tundra. So few things can, can survive there. Now, when it comes to, well, you know, how well is the tundra going to survive? It's going to be kind of problematic how well it does. Uh, when we look at it, because we only regenerate, you know, a couple months a year, that regeneration, that slow growth, that low productivity is going to take a long time to overcome any problem. And so, you know, here, you know, we talked about Anwar, uh, we talked about all the caribou, here's a bunch of caribou, you know, they're up there in the tundra, they migrated in to give birth to all their young. And what do we got in the back here? But some sort of pad with, uh, you know, supporting this structure, you know, big foundation put in, lots of industrialization, we got, you know, an oil well going in, oil production in the tundra area here. And so it isn't just the presence there, but the noise. Here, if you're a caribou and you're trying to, you know, give birth, you want to be in this kind of environment with a bunch of, you know, toxic fumes and, you know, potential oil spills and all that noise pollution going on around you. Plus there's all that traffic. Because, I mean, are you going to be helicoptering everything in? No. You're going to be using that bulldozer to haul all the stuff in during the frozen uh, time of the year, put it in place. Um, you know, it, it sounds good when uh, uh, developers talk about, you know, how environmental friendly they are. But in the end result, there is disruption. And you take a... Uh, you know, bulldozer track across the tundra, you're ripping up that tundra as you're going along. And, you know, people go up there and they see where 50 years ago, a, a tracked vehicle had gone across the, the tundra and it still has not had time to repair itself. And so you go up there, <clears throat> you make any kind of mess out of the tundra and it may take you know, 100 years for that tundra to recover because of a low productivity. All right, you're in the desert, right? And so you go into a desert, uh, you know, the Southwest desert, the same thing holds. You start, you know, knocking down the cacti, uh, you start stomping on the vegetation, and it's going to require maybe not centuries, but a long time. I mean, that's a rough environment in order to try and regrow. Um, Global warming, you read about, you know, the, the Arctic and the tundra and all kinds of melting going on. And so now we're actually getting permafrost that is melting, that had never melted in the past few thousand years. And then what happens? It ends up, nobody thought about this before, but now they do because they know that melting uh, permafrost 
is giving off methane that had been trapped and sequestered. And methane is more of a global warming uh, gas than CO2, about 20 times more uh, per molecule than CO2. And so, you know, it's a big impact all around, uh, no matter what you're, you're you know, worried about. Um, but anyway, you know, people are going up there and kind of an interesting uh, uh, television show that had been on a few years back. I saw a couple episodes and so, you know, I kind of thought it was interesting. Um, Ice Road Truckers was a, a television show and it basically talked about how, um, you know, a, a big industrial site where they were, where they had found diamonds. So they were putting in this, you know, just multi-billion dollar uh, diamond pit with extraordinarily huge machines and industrial capacity uh, to build, you know, this, this multi-square mile pit with, you know, the ability to pump water out of the pit as it fills up, you know, just, just an amazing structure. But how do you get all the, the equipment up there? Well, during the middle of winter, you get a whole bunch of water and you lay it down on top of the tundra and it freezes. Now you can run trucks across that frozen roadway. As long as you're not doing this in the middle of summer, that frozen roadway can support, you know, this multi-ton truck, you got 800 or uh, 80 tons uh, uh, that you're packing on a on a 18 wheel truck or so well, along you go on this road. You got to take heavier loads than that because they're taking huge machines up there. And well, you just put more wheels on the 18 wheeler and, and you're taking these just amazingly huge loads and you just got to make that road, that ice road that you built just for that winter even thicker. And so you know, they had kind of like a little meme on that. And I thought that was nice because you're just going off and there's the, the sun low on the horizon, the ice road, and it's flat and there's no trees. Just gave that person uh, who, who wrote the little thing just the feeling of what the tundra is all about. And, you know, Matt Goring there, the guy who uh, did the, the Simpsons, instigated the Simpsons and you know he came up with with this is is his feeling for you know what the tundra uh, really brings to mind right how the tundra uh, truly is and so we'll put that aside okay so that was the tundra <clears throat> and uh, basically you know we got an idea of what you're looking for when we're talking about biomes, the characteristics of, of the abiotic, then what vegetation can live on that abiotic, and then what kind of uh, animals can deal with the abiotic and the biotic vegetation that's in place. Animals dependent on all the rest that we had gone through first. And so now we look at us, where do we live? Well, we're in this eastern portion of the North America that has the temperate deciduous forest. Temperate, temperate temperatures, well, and it's enough moisture that we can have a forest. And so trees, they're not going to grow in the Great Plains very well because there's not enough rain. You need to have higher rainfall, maybe like 60 inches a year of rain in order to get good good tree growth. And so we take a look down here, physical features, the abiotic realm. Well-defined vegetation associated uh, deciduous trees, shrubs, and what do they need? They need a good amount of rain, right? 30 to 60 inches, right? Mostly during uh, the time when it's going to be useful during the summer, during the spring, when growth is occurring. Snow, isn't going to be helpful as much. And so mostly raining during the, the time when you need it. Uh, growing season, much longer than you would find 
up in the, the Arctic, but it's not going to be 365 days like you'd find down in the tropics. Temperatures can get pretty low. Remember, we can go all the way up into uh, Canada with this, right? Right until we butt against the Tega on this eastern coast. <coughs> so temperatures can get real cold. But, you know, here in Tennessee, yeah, we're probably not going to see any negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but, you know, we might come up with a negative two or three once in a while in a cold winter. And, you know, if we go all the way to extreme stuff, well, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, again, kind of an extreme. Hopefully, it may feel like that, but hopefully we don't get quite that high in Tennessee. But, you know, this does fit overall, you know, the parameters of what you might expect here. Hurricanes, freezing rain, these are going to be important because they are going to kind of take out bits of this forest and the trees. And so that gives the opportunity to regrow, all right? And so the renewal aspect is there. You're never going to lose all the trees to the hurricane, but you might get, you know, a, a big swath taken out and then regrowth, new growth is going to start from there, a succession of, of trees until you get back to the old growth. Well, we're never going to see the old growth again because we keep cutting the trees down even as they mature, right? All right, but, you know, that would have been the natural condition, right? Acid soils, fertile, good soils for agriculture. Um, you go down to the tropics and there's so much rain, it just leaches the uh, nutrients, the minerals, right through the soil, and any nutrients that are that are there, you got decaying branches, whatever, on the on the ground, those nutrients immediately suck back up into the plants. They're going to take whatever they can real quick. So, agriculturally, the tropics not so good. Those rainforests, when they cut them down to plant things, they burn the rainforest so that all the ashes are going to accumulate into the soil for, you know, maybe three to five years. And then the nutrients are gone. They, they went into your crops. Now you got to go slash and burn another swath of the, the trop, tropical rainforest in order to, you know, grow new crops, right? And so it's either that or you keep adding the expensive fertilizer. All right. Fire, major in addition to hurricane and, you know, breaking the winds and stuff, are major renewal. And so as those lightning strikes hit, sets fire to all the accumulating uh, uh, underbrush. And, you know, there we have a fire ravaged area that then goes through a nice renewal in succession. And so we keep diversity up. You don't have just the end old growth forest. You end up destroying some of that by local uh, catastrophes. And then you have the new vegetation, all new different kinds of plants growing in for, you know, maybe uh, 10 years of this this succession stage, uh, 20 years of the next succession stage. So grasses, shrubs, uh, large shrubs, small trees, large trees um, and different kinds of trees, uh, uh, short life trees to the very long life trees. So you get this whole succession going on uh, once you clear something out and let it you know, renew itself in that area. Okay, specifically about the vegetation, we go from the abiotic to the vegetation, deciduous broadleaf, losing their leaves during the winter. When we think about all those flat leaves, those flat leaves are great to, to spread out and catch the sunlight, right? Get lots of those flat leaves and we can be very efficient in, in really going after during those few months of summer and spring maybe even a little into the fall, and then the leaves die and they drop to the ground. And so deciduous 
We have to regrow every year the leaves. When we think about the conifers, right? Things like the pines, the conifers there. We tend to find conifers at high altitude where there's maybe a lot of snow, a lot of cold weather. And so you think about the conifers and they have all those little needles and they don't shed them all at once. Well, some do, there are certain uh, conifers that do shed their, their needles all at once during the winter, but we won't worry about that. Most of them are gonna be shedding a few needles a year, but then renewing them, but never shed all of their needles. And so you go, you buy your Christmas tree and it has needles on it. And you look at your Christmas tree and it has you know, that shape like this. You look at your deciduous tree, like an apple tree, whatever, and it's got the, the branches that are spreading out kind of like that. And so now you think during the middle of winter, what's going to happen? You got all that snow falling and, and laying on top of all the, the branches and all that weight bearing down on it. And the branches break, the power line, you know, here's, here's the telephone pole. Here's the power line and the telephone line. And basically the branch falls and it takes out your power. Here, we're looking at a conifer, a pine tree. And so all the snow falls on that, all the snow. And basically what happens is if it accumulates enough weight, it just kind of rolls off the, the steep roof. It doesn't end up breaking all the branches as it would with a deciduous, deciduous tree. But it's gonna be real tough for these guys to compete against all those broadleaf trees, right? They're much more efficient. These guys, if you're way up in that uh, boreal forest, way high north where you only have conifers, as soon as the, the water unfreezes and your roots can pull up the water, you can start photosynthesizing because you got your leaf already ready to go, right? You never lost it over the winter. And so that tough little leaf, you know, really good in a northern rough climate. Down here, northern trees are going to be found at high altitude in the alpine re or just below the alpine region of the of the high mountains. All right, so all kinds of hardwoods. Uh, you see examples here. Don't worry about the species name, but recognize oak maple, and we're going to talk about chestnuts. Uh, hickory here, uh, basswood, you know, trees that you would recognize uh, as being in the forest. So for the chestnut tree, we'll come back to that. All right, and what do they do to prevent freezing in the, the um, winter? They're storing the sugar, and it kind of acts as a little bit of an antifreeze so that they just don't die. Good idea, good for the tree. All right, lots of shrubs and, and what? You go off into uh, Eastern uh, uh, Tennessee and you see all the rhododendrons in bloom, uh, blueberries everywhere, these kinds of things. Lots of grass, lots of wildflowers all through the summer. There's plenty of time. It's not like in the tundra where you gotta all bloom and, and grow fast because you got a short summer. You have plenty of time. You can have early wildflowers in the spring, wildflowers in the early summer, late summer, late fall. And so, you know, nice diversity of plants taking advantage all year round. The kinds of animals, you know what they are. Now, here we go. You take a look, and there we are in kind of that temperate forest. And you got bunches of deer now, uh, rabbits, raccoons. Uh, all kinds of uh, songbirds and, and passerines and whatnot, chipmunks, they're all out there. And so we get that example. We used to have a much higher diversity of predators, but you can imagine. All right, what do we do if we have a bunch of wolves in Tennessee? What do we do if we have a bunch of bobcat? What if we do if we have mountain lions? Well, you probably better do something. Get rid of these guys because 
are they going to be eating your sheep and cows and uh, horses? And well, so the early settlers, if they saw any of these major predators, where are all the bears? Well, you know, you might find some in Eastern Tennessee, but you're not going to find them in Knoxville, Nashville, or Memphis. All these things, they've been extirpated. Yes, you can find a mountain lion in uh, the Great West in the Rocky Mountains, but here in Tennessee, they used to be all over the place running around. Now they're not extinct in North America, but they're extirpated. They're extinct in Tennessee. Right? So good word, notice I circled it, begins with an E. So you had extinct, you know, the species is gone from everywhere, here's extirpated, it's extinct locally. Uh, lots of birds migrating back and forth, some of them all year round. Reptiles and amphibians, uh, yeah, cold-blooded for the most part. Uh, we're going to think that, you know, how can they survive during the winter? Well, they go underground typically and go into a hibernation, a dormancy. Uh, little frogs and toads, you get into the mud under the frost line and you'll be okay as long as you reduce your metabolism and just hang out until warm weather uh, comes back. And so here's kind of an interesting thing. When we look, we really do not have hardly anything that has not been um, cut down all along this entire eastern part of the United States. There is no what you would refer to as, you know, virgin, uncut, old forest. There's no old forest. The old forest, you would have, you know, trees, the, the trunks, you could not, you know, get your entire family and have them put their arms around the tree. You could not link your whole family around some of these old growth, huge trees that just climbed up three, 400 feet high. These were huge old growth trees. We came in, we saw them all, and we thought, let's make a farm here. Let's build things with these trees. We cut, you know, basically the entire eastern United States uh, uh, temperate forest down. And of course, a lot of it regrows. You know, that, that happens. Um, you know, trees are putting out their seeds and, and they grew, regrow. But you don't find old growth now. As soon as the trees get to a mature enough size that you can log them, somebody's going to go in and log the trees out because it's a crop. You make money. And you know, how much of this whole Eastern United States or really how much of the entire United States is not privately owned, right? And if it's privately owned, well, you're paying taxes on it. You gotta pay your taxes. How are you gonna make money on all this land? Well, you know, either you turn it into a farmland or you uh, grow crops on it. Uh, uh, and one of the crops can be trees. And so we basically have clear cutted all this forested land, and you know now it's urban areas, it's farms, um, you know logged areas, uh, you know, and, and actually a lot of the forest uh, has regrown since early part of the 1900s, late 1800s. There were far more farms, you know, when a third of your whole population was engaged in farming, you had to have a lot of farms, and that took a lot of area. Now a lot of those farms have basically come back to forest. I remember seeing pictures of uh, where I grew up in Vermont. Uh, you know, we're on the side of the mountain and I looked at pictures and saw what it was like when my father was young, right? Growing up when he was in uh, the 1920s and 30s and, and 40s, uh, that's when he was growing up. And the valley was farmland. By the time I was, you know, old enough to, to be looking out across 
uh, uh, the fields of the farm, the valley was deforested. And now when I go back there, uh, basically the fields, you know, where I used to walk in fields, there are now forests, you know, they're not huge trees. They're not quite ready to be cut down and logged, but you know, where there used to be a cow barnyard is now just a whole bunch of, of cherry trees and well, mixed deciduous and maple trees. And my brother is right there tapping those trees, the maple trees. You know, forest where it used to be a barnyard. Well, all right, on we go. Just, you know, talk to your grandparents, talk to your, your grandmother. Has there been any kind of change that she has noticed since she's been a little girl, forest-wise and land-wise, right? Okay, so that's something that has gone on. Um, we do have, you know, some erosion going on, uh, you know, particularly in certain areas, uh, you know, loss of habitat, Maryland. It's right next to Washington, D.C., Chesapeake Bay right there huge urban area, Baltimore. This used to be so much more of a wetland habitat. Now it's pretty much gone with a bunch of trees there, right? So gone. Um, and in wetlands, they serve kind of as a sponge to prevent flooding. So, you know, lots of things going on. We're losing a lot of habitat. But I want to come back and hit on the, the Chinese uh, chestnut and what it did to the American chestnut tree. And so here's a picture. It's from an old photograph. Here's an American chestnut tree. And we look at that. That's just a big tree, but you can get the form of it right here. This is a big tree. And here, you know, some leaves and got the chestnuts. Chestnuts right here. Yeah. Chestnuts and uh, roasting by an open fire, Christmas time, right? All that song uh, dealing with, you know, the fun of of doing something. You know, let's eat the chestnuts in the in the wind. Okay. Now, once an important hardwood timber tree, the American chestnut, highly susceptible to chestnut blight, caused by an Asian bark fungus, mm. and so. The fungus actually introduced into North America on, on imported Asiatic chestnut trees. So somebody brought the trees. Disease was first noticed on American chestnut trees in what was then the New York Zoological Park, right? now known as the Bronx Zoo, in 1904 by Chief Forester uh, Herman Merkel. He estimated that by 1906, blight had infected 98% of the trees in the Bronx. So, comes off a, a imported tree, an exotic tree to, to North America, this, this Chinese uh, chestnut or Japanese uh, also. Uh, and so it brought with it a fungus that didn't really hurt it, but if it got onto the American chestnut tree, well, the American didn't have any resistance. And so it basically just spread that fungus 80 kilometers a year, 50 miles a year. And in a few decades, basically killed off the 3 billion American chestnut trees that we would have in the forest. Okay. And so up here, um, the total number of chestnut trees in Eastern North America estimated over 3 billion, 25% of the trees in the Appalachian Mountain were American chestnut, right? And so uh, when we look now, we do find a few little isolated trees that are over 60 or two feet in diameter. Right? But wait till you see the pictures of how big a chestnut tree can be. You know, we'll see that at the end. But, you know, just two feet around 
And we only have maybe like a hundred of these, fewer than that. And they're in isolated areas that just manage to be outside of where the, the Appalachian trees would be. You go to Cape Cod and there are a few kind of, you know, lonely chestnut trees there apparently growing. And it's kind of a big deal that they are there. But what if somebody were to accidentally bring in the blight? Well, they'd be gone. Um, there are uh, little saplings that are, are coming up from the stumps of all the dead chestnut trees. But by the time they get big enough, you know, far before they get to 24 inches, they die from the fungus. Any kind of open wound and they're gonna get the fungus, they're gonna die. And so we have, you know, along the entire Appalachian mountains, all these trees dying, you know, a quarter of, of the entire uh, uh, tree uh, species that, um, you know, somebody like Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone would have kind of, oh, you know, who could imagine to be without these trees? And, you know, if you got enough grand, old enough grandmother, grandmothers would have remembered these trees. If they had been, you know, alive during the early parts of the 1900s, they would remember chestnut trees. All right. And there's all kinds of, you know, is there some way we can save uh, the American chestnut doing all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, you know, growing them out west. You know, people before the fungus struck, they had traveled out west, we're on our little wagon train, we got a bunch of nuts with us, uh, you know, chestnuts. And so somewhere out there, oh, this is where we'll build our new house. Let's plant one of those nuts. And so you'll find you know, bits of you know, chestnut trees on the other side of the Great Plains where the fungus has not been able to get across, all right? So a big barrier there. So there are little bits there, a couple up in Michigan. Um, and then there are the people that are trying to create resistant American chestnuts. Kind of an interesting thing is that they uh, said that, you know, when the, the fungus plague went through, you know, they would go in and they cut down all the chestnut trees so that they could salvage, right, salvage logging. But, you know, there's the chestnut tree that might just have been resistant, but they were logged down too. So even the ones that might have been able to survive, right, that whole business of natural selection, yeah, you took out, you know, 99.9 .9 of the chestnut trees, but there's that point one that had some mutation that they could survive the fungus, just like the Asian trees. Well, they got cut down too. So we don't have any uh, left, kind of a sad thing. All right, well, uh, going on a little bit, uh, here we have the distribution of the chestnut tree. And so, you know, all through the Appalachians and way up here, yeah, here's the Hudson Valley going up Lake Champlain, all along there. And then up oh, right here, uh, no, chestnut trees didn't go over to where I come from. All right, but down in Massachusetts, yeah, you know, there I had gone to undergraduate school about right in here. And yeah, if I had gone there in the, the late 1800s, when UMass had first been uh, created, yep, there would have been a chestnut tree. So a little bit about me, all right. Um, here, oh, I probably should have introduced this uh, with the, the initial thing, but you might have heard you know, a Longfellow poem. Under a spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. The smith, a mighty man, is he with large and sinewy hands, and the muscles of his brawny arms are strong as iron bands. And so we go through this poem by Longfellow, and it's uh, very very touching, heartfelt poem, but the first line, under a spring chestnut tree, you know, the chestnut tree, so big and massive. When you first built your, your building and your workshop, you would leave maybe one real big tree just to kind of sh shade over the whole area. You'd cut down everything else to, 
have your fields. You know, where I grew up, there was a huge elm tree, right? But, you know, that ended up getting cut down, Dutch elm disease. Uh, but here, you know, the surviving uh, 1800s, uh, when Longfellow was writing, you'd know that, you know, there'd be lots of chestnut trees being saved around the house. And so it's a nice little poem. You can look it up on the internet if you, if you like. And kind of as a, a little gift, the chestnut tree uh, that had been, you know, written the poem about, um, you know, eventually, you know, 1879, Longfellow. The tree got cut down and they made a chair um, out of the, the tree that had been in the poem. So kind of a sad ending. Uh, how ironic uh, for, the, for the tree. Um, picking up, I'll show you, you know, this little figure right here. Uh, the old forest arboretum of Overton Park. And so, you know, here in Tennessee, do we have any old growth forest? Well, kind of, kind of. And so over here somewhere in Memphis, there's a little park where you can go and see some old trees. No chestnuts, but, you know, trees that have kind of grown to their old glory. There's, I think, somewhere um, in Nashville, yeah, there's a city forest so somewhere over in here. You can find kind of an old growth preserve, never having been really cut down. And then in the Blue Ridge Mountains, somewhere in Appalachia area here, you can find in some of the national state parks areas that have not been cut down, but very few, right? Compared to the acreage of, of all of Tennessee, uh, you know, you could fit all the acres of old growth uh, you know, in the, in the city limits of Mackenzie, right? There's just not a whole lot of it around. So, you know, in every state, yeah, there might be a tiny little patch. Uh, when I was up in Pennsylvania teaching, there was Cook's Forest. Kind of ironic again, because Cook, you know, his, when, when he was alive in the 1800s, uh, he was cutting down the Pennsylvania forest. But you know, here, around his house, he left old growth forest. You know, he could afford to. He was essentially, you know, a billionaire of his time, a billionaire from cutting down the Pennsylvania forest. And, you know, he deeded that over to the state and it hadn't been cut down. So Cook's Forest, you know, a, a major destroyer of the environment back in the 1800s. And now you can go look at it. But none of these old growth forests are like the old growth forest pre-European colonization because they have been changed so much. You know, you go to the, the uh, uh, Cook's Forest, for example, and a big thing that I remember there is that the foresters, the state foresters, built a chain link fence around, you know, a, a small quarter of an acre of the old growth forest, because what they wanted to see was what the succession, could we regenerate the trees of old? Could we get succession going by keeping out the deer? There are so few predators and the deer went wild that they basically go into the old growth forest and they just browse any new growth down. And so, yep, there's a big old oak tree, you know, 350 years old, but you don't find any of the other huge trees in the, the cathedral grove, right? The old cathedral, it's huge trees. It's like you're in a, in, a, in a cathedral. You don't find any young trees. Why? Because the deer have eaten them away. And so you got old trees, no you know, maturing trees uh, getting there, no young trees. The old trees, they're going to die. And you know, there's not necessarily you know, a bunch of 
of middle-aged trees to take their place. And so, yeah, the foresters, they know what they're doing. They're trying to prevent uh, uh, the, the end destruction of what they have in their care, the old world forest. But it's just not the same as it had been way back when. You don't have the elk running around in the Tennessee forest. You don't have the predators running around like they had then. You don't have bison. Bison used to be in Tennessee too, but they're not here today. You know, all these animals have been extirpated from the area. Okay, um, a couple more things and then we'll be done with uh, chestnut tree. Here, you know, here's you know, some person, I don't know, maybe not six feet tall, but, but certainly he's kind of a, a big guy. And, you know, there's another one over there, you know, five feet, eight inches tall. Uh, lumberjacks next to old growth chestnut trees around 1909, before, before the fungus took hold. And you can see, you know, they spread their arms out and this tree has a much greater diameter than just, you know, and they're cutting these things now and, and getting logs. But the name of this article comes out of the Atlantic, genetically engineering an icon in biotech, make the chestnut, or bring the chestnut back to American forest. And so, you know, oh, now it's more than 3 billion. It's 4 billion of these tower trees. So, you know, maybe a more modern estimate uh, you know, of how many trees there have been and it just keeps getting worse and worse. And so here, you know, they're making uh, genetic manipulation, transgenic trees that contain uh, genes from other, right? Okay, yeah, we're making all kinds of things like transgenic palms and papayas for agriculture. So can we do it for the chestnut? And so can we put in, you know, genes that will make our American chestnut tree um, you know, not uh, susceptible to make them resistant, like if we can take that, that Asian gene out and put it in our uh, chestnut, then it can survive having the, the plague of the fungus. And so I'm going to kind of switch the sharing, see how well we do with that. I'm going to go the screen, see if it comes up, and of course, there we go, it worked out. Technology, helpful this time around. And uh, basically, what, I, what I'm pulling up is, uh, you know, th this is a, um, a website uh, put together by a bunch of map paper, map, map makers and you know they're given the opportunity uh to you know put together some interesting little topics and you know their topic was fall of the american chestnut you know somebody just put it together and so uh here uh, home you know we had under the spreading chestnut tree here robert frost after the blight had taken hold well during the middle of it when you know, the chestnut trees were, were truly gone, wrote a poem called Evil Tendencies. Will the blight end the chestnut? The farmer rather guess not. It keeps smoldering at the roots and sending up new shoots till another parasite shall come to end the blight. And so, yeah, we're talking about the chestnut tree, the blight that kills it. But, you know, at the bottom, you know, even though we may have no hope, maybe something is going to take out that fungus, that it will have its own light, you know, and that's kind of the way of the world, right? You know, if you, you take out something, something will take you out. And so that well, you can think about that for your philosophy. But, you know, here's chestnut tree uh, trunk and the orange that you see, there's the fungus growing in a little patch and it's going to basically kill off, uh, girdle the tree, you know, kind of destroy the, the outer rind of the tree. And so now 
the, the fluids cannot go up and down along that outer rind of the tree because uh, the fungus is basically taking care of all the, the nutrients that it can get. So I'm going to go. What's the next picture? Uh, the picture that you saw before, a classic uh, showing how big those trees could be. Oh, there's lightning in the background. Uh, here, this is a map, and this gives us more of a good timeline of how fast that blight went. And so New York City right here, 1904, and then, oh, here's 1910, and we're seeing the first circle around there. Uh, that's how far the blight had gone. Uh, next circle, 1920, you know, that's how far it had been there. 1930, managed to get around there. 1940 well, here, 1950 here. And so it just keeps going uh, until you get pretty much every tree infected. And so, yeah, they, they have an extended range. So maybe, uh, you know, if you didn't get every single a chestnut tree here. The fungus actually does infect other trees, but the other trees may just harbor it. They might be carriers. So if you were to plant a chestnut tree way out here, it would still get infected. All right. And so kind of a nice little um, map that they're showing what the ESIR is all about. Um, you know, where did the invader come from? Well, Japanese Chinese chestnut trees brought in by boat as lumber, right? And probably carried the spore with it. That's why when you go to, you know, a state park, they tell you don't, you know, bring in firewood from somewhere else because you might be bringing in insects that are, you know, new that have infected trees elsewhere. You don't bring in firewood that you cut, you know, 100 miles away to the state park that you want to stay at that, you know, evening. Same ways with watercraft. If you're out there on a pond, you pull your, your boat out. You're not supposed to take that boat and go to a, another pond uh, and put the boat in without cleaning the underside of the boat, making sure you're not carrying any kind of aquatic organism and inadvertently putting it in uh, the water somewhere else. You don't want exotic species, right? Species that are new, novel, don't belong in that new area. And so, okay, Trojan horse along with uh, 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 lumber comes the fungus hidden inside. Uh, just showing the progression, uh, you know, back in 1913, 1912, the progress progression of the blight across Pennsylvania. You know, in Pennsylvania, they tried to actually make breaks, mile wide breaks where they cut down all the, the chestnut trees <coughs> so that the infected chestnut trees could not send the the fungus, the fungus could not get across that mile wide band. Imagine cutting a mile wide band across your whole state. This must have been economically important to stop the blight if they went to that amount of effort. This is money we're talking about. And so that's the effort that they were making. Well, here's some chestnut tree leaves. Nice little figure. Uh, oh, uh, maybe that. Yeah, a little growth of an American chestnut. Again, they've got all kinds of people across the United States trying different ways to see if they can get chestnut trees to grow. You know, we saw that transgenic. It's not the only way. Can we get resistant ones? Uh, can we, you know, get spores of, of another fungus that uh, uh, we'll get the fungus that we're, you know, the Robert Frost parasite, the Eaton parasite, uh, you know, just all kinds of different ways. Uh, just look up on the internet and it will be real interesting. Um, it's fascinating what people are up to. Uh, I'm going to go back to the camera for one last thing. I have associated 
in the materials for this exam number two uh, videos. A separate video that normally I would have shown during class. There's the address for the video. You can find the connection in the Google Classroom. And these questions, they're there in the, the description for the YouTube access link. And so I'd like for you to think about these things, watch the video, maybe it would show up on an exam somewhere, this kind of stuff. It's wonderful history. They're talking to people's grandmothers and grandfathers. And what was it like? And what, what was the economic value? And basically they'll talk about, you know, from cradle to grave. What does that really mean? Hmm. Okay, and so I'll stop here with this uh, uh, lecture. We saw a couple examples of biomes, uh, you know, the tundra and uh, uh, the temperate uh, deciduous forest that we live in. And so, you know, think about you know, abiotic plants, animals, and the conditions necessary uh, to keep them all going. All right. Talk to you next time.